We are so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us today as we gather for this beautiful Palm Sunday service. Uh, we are blessed today to wake up this morning to sunshine and wind and very minimal damage. Others have not been so fortunate uh, in the states that border ours and others to our west. Continue to keep them very much in your prayers as you pray. We finish a three-part sermon series entitled Intimate Moments with Jesus. Two Sundays ago, we talked about Jesus' anointing by Mary for his burial. Last Sunday, we talked about the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, and that intimate moment that Jesus had with his disciples. And today, we want to talk about the foot washing in John 13, verses 1 through 17, where again we see Jesus having an intimate moment with his disciples uh, just before he would be betrayed, arrested, put on trial, beaten, crucified, and died. So this is a very, very critical time in Jesus' life. And I find it very interesting uh, who the people are that Jesus chose to spend his last hours and moments with on the face of the earth. So, if you would listen as I read John 13, verse 1 through 17. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, celebrated by the people as a king. The people cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. People welcomed and honored Jesus by spreading their clothes and palm branches on the road before Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem. Even though Jesus was met with such fanfare, Jesus did not allow the accolades of the people to change who he was. Remember, remember, Jesus walked out of Jerusalem carrying a cross and the weight of the sin of the world. In between these two events, Jesus took the humble position of a servant as he washed his disciples' feet. 
throughout the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus in his three plus years of ministry serving an untold multitude of people. But on this night recorded in John 13, Jesus focuses his service on his disciples. This is a very intimate setting. This is a very intimate moment. As we have spoken in the past, table fellowship, a meal shared together is a very intimate moment in our lives. And can I share with you this morning, intimate moments reveal who we are at the core of our being. So who was Jesus at the core? Jesus was the Son of Man, the Son of God, who at the very core was a man of great love, humility, and deep commitment. He had a deep commitment to seeing the will of God fulfilled in his life for his life. We will let Jesus answer for himself. In John 6, 38, we find that Jesus came to do the will of the Father. I remember on occasion Jesus said, I speak the things I hear my Father say, and I do the things I see my Father do. He said, it is my meat, it is my food to do the will of the Father. That speaks to who Jesus was at the core of his being. In Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, we find out that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came from where? Heaven. He left the splendor of heaven to be born from Mary's womb, to live a life very much like ours. Why? Because in his commitment and love for God in humankind, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. But then he also tells us in Matthew 20, verse number 28, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So we see in Jesus' own words the kind of person Jesus was and is. He came humbly. He came full of God's love. And he came to see God's will fulfilled in his life. On this evening in John 13, Jesus served his disciples in an intimate and a powerful way, including Judas, the betrayer, Peter, the denier, and all who would just a few hours later abandon him. Jesus did not let the attitudes or the actions of his disciples or any other people change who he was. We could learn a great lesson from Jesus if we would follow his pattern and example and not let the actions and attitudes of others change who we are. John tells us in verse number 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper. Why? To prepare himself as a servant and wash his disciples' feet. Now, we don't know the order of the disciples in which the feet were washed. But what we do clearly see is Judas was one of those disciples. Seated at the table, finishing the meal, the one who was identified as the one who would betray him. But Judas's potential betrayal did not define or change who Jesus was in that moment. Jesus maintained his humility and his love while he served Judas by washing his feet, all the while knowing that Judas was about to betray him. It goes back to what John said early in the chapter. He loved them to the end, including Judas. Peter. I can relate to Peter because there's, there are those moments in life that I open my big mouth to. Anybody else out there can relate to opening your big mouth and then wishing you had not? 
You know why I have big feet? Because I have a big mouth. And it takes a lot of foot to fill up this mouth sometimes. I wish that were not the case, but sometimes it is. And Peter, in his pride, often said things that I bet he wished he could grab and pull right back. Oh, he was a powerful disciple, but he had pride. But Peter's pride did not change or define who Jesus was. Even while around the table, Peter engages Jesus with even the topic of washing his feet. Oh, you'll never wash my feet. But you know what? Jesus loved them to the end. And he loved Peter to the end. Now Peter had walked with Jesus, had revelation from God, had been sent out by Christ to do the works of Christ as a disciple, but he still did not have the humility he needed to have to be that person Jesus was calling him to be. The fact that Jesus knew he would shortly be abandoned by all his disciples and be denied by Peter and betrayed by, Jesus, by Judas did not change who Jesus was. It did not define him. He was there to make them better. Jesus loved them to the end. While the disciples cared about themselves, Jesus took the last moments of his life to teach them the greatest lessons of love, humility, and service. We shouldn't let the people around us change or define who we are. God defined who Jesus was and is, and God desires to do the same for you and I. Even the trial that was before Jesus did not change who Jesus was. And I am very, very, very impressed that even though he had at the table Judas who would betray him, Peter who would deny him, twelve disciples who would abandon him, Jesus was still able to stay focused in the moment. I don't know about you, but if I knew I was about to be betrayed, I was about to be arrested, I was about to be carried to trial and found guilty even though I was innocent. If I was about to be scourged, if I was about to be crucified to die upon a cross, I may find better things to do than wash my buddy's feet. I would probably be at my mother's right hand going, Mama, they're going to betray me. My best friends are going to leave me. In my greatest time of need, they're going to nail me to a cross. I don't like pain. And I'm going to die there, a cruel death. Mama, what can you do? Now that sounds like me, but it doesn't sound anything like Jesus. Because even though he knew what was about to come his way, he stayed focused in the moment because he knew how powerful this intimate moment was for his disciples. And he knew that in the midst of the greatest crisis of his life, he needed to teach his disciples how to act and respond in the midst of crisis because he knew they too would one day face life and death circumstances for the furtherance of the gospel of the kingdom of God in and through Christ Jesus. Jesus knew what was ahead. So he used those last moments to teach his best lessons by washing his disciples' feet and showing them a very clear picture of what love and humility and commitment look like through his example. Jesus continued to be the same humble, loving servant of God he had always been. Now you know as well as I do that sometimes the trials of life bring out the worst in us. 
Can you think about those moments too this morning? Look back over the years and when the heat got hot, the worst in you came out for everybody to see. Sometimes the trials in life bring to the surface the worst of who we are. Why? So that the worst can then be removed by the steady hand of Jesus. Now, if the doctors said that you had cancer, you would want the steady hand of the surgeon to very carefully and skillfully remove that from your body so that you could go forward in a happy and a healthy manner. Jesus knows how to do spiritual surgery to make us a better, healthier child of God. Paul talk, uh, Peter talks about the refining process, that the, that the trying of our faith is more precious than gold. The refining of our faith is more precious than gold. Have you ever seen them refine gold the old-fashioned way? They heat it up to 1,100 degrees Celsius. That's hot. 1,100 degrees Celsius in that little cup that won't melt, there the gold lays until it melts. And as it sits there in 1,100 degrees Celsius, the impurities begin to rise to the top. And as they rise to the top and settle there, that goldsmith can scrape the impurities off the top and cast them away. The refining fire came to the disciples and Jesus was there with them so that that stuff, that, that dross, those impurities could be scraped away and cast aside. Then the trials of life will bring to the surface the best of who we are simply because we are the same all the way to the core. Oh, I look forward to that day that when I go through the fiery trials of life, the only thing that comes out of my mouth, my heart, the only thing that is seen in my actions are the goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ inside of me. Oh, that God would take us there. Maybe this is why Jesus chose to wash the disciples' feet as one of his last acts of service. Our feet represent our walk or our life or how we live life from day to day. It is evident that the disciples needed their feet, their walk, bathed. And Jesus did that in both a literal way and in a spiritual way. Now then, when we think about those disciples gathered around the table, we think about Judas and we think, wow, he just appears to be rotten to the core. He refuses every opportunity to change, but Jesus continues to give him opportunities to change even up until the last moments of his life. Peter had potential. He had great potential and Jesus saw that. He was a mixed bag of, a mixed bag of good and bad. Jesus desired to take the bad away. And in the hours and days and months ahead, that would be addressed. Even the disciples, all the rest of the disciples, they needed work just like we do. We need to go through that refining process that Jesus can take out of us that which is not pleasing to him or us. Every crisis reveals what we lack and what we need from God. Judas lacked a heart for Jesus. He had a heart for other things, just like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and walked away sorrowful because he had great possessions. And Jesus said, sell what you have, give them to the poor and follow me. No, his heart was somewhere else. Judas's heart was somewhere else. He lacked a heart for Jesus. He needed a heart for Jesus. We have no record that he ever obtained one. Peter lacked humility. That would come. All the disciples needed faith and courage and other things, and those things would come too in the long run. We often do not know what we truly lack in life, what we truly need, until we get into the moment of crisis. And then we find out, oh no, I don't have the faith to see me through. Oh no, I don't have the peace to see me through. Oh no, I don't have the resources to see me through. Then we can ask. And God 
will freely give. If God has freely given us Christ Jesus, will he not freely give us all things? Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. I just have to wonder about the disciples in the days, the weeks, the months, the years ahead. I have to wonder about those occasions that they stop and begin to talk about that night when Jesus washed their feet. He told Peter, You'll know one day why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I wonder if the disciples realized and recognized that all the while, through the betrayal, through the denial, through the abandonment, that Jesus stayed the same. But they did not. They did not stay the same. Those who would be his friends, would be his disciples, one would betray him, one would deny, and all would run away. But Jesus would remain the same. But in the days and weeks and months ahead, they got to change. Because as they wandered and journeyed together through the fiery trials of life and faith, Jesus was there to scrape away the impurities in their life. The refiner of gold is asked, how do you know when your job is done? How do you know when the gold is pure? And the answer is, when I can look in and see the reflection of my face, then I know the job is done. So that's exactly what Jesus is doing in our midst today. Refining, looking, watching for His image, His reflection in our hearts and in our lives. As we see in Jesus' life, true greatness in God's kingdom is found in love, humility, and a deep commitment to seeing God's will fulfilled in one's life. Jesus did not allow the attitudes or the actions of others to change who He was or to keep Him from fulfilling God's will for his life. Neither did he allow what he was about to suffer to change who he was. May we be more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 We have a hymn of response this morning. What wondrous love is this? Hymn 292. We invite you to stand with us as we sing our hymn of response. Our altars are open. If you need or desire prayer this morning, we invite you to come. If I can pray with you about anything, get my attention. I would love to pray for you, with you this morning. Sing with us, church. <laughs>